It's another edition of Time About the Movies, and today we're taking a look at the films of August 13th, 2004. we got three films to look at today, so let's not waste any more time. Let's get right to them. We'll start off with the biggest new release of the weekend. Freddy and Jason fought each other on this weekend a year ago, so um, about the alien and the predator. Let's see what they can do in about. This is Alien vs. Predator. Fun fact, whoever wins, we lose. This is also the official tagline for the 2024 election for some people. Um, <laughs> I, I've, been waiting to use the, I've been waiting to get to this movie so I can actually say that, but um, of course that has now changed in the last week if you have been following the news. But um, we're not here to talk about politics. We're here to talk about Alien vs. Predator. Uh, Paul W.S. Anderson's uh, film after he made Resident Evil. A uh, film that is essentially, it is what it says, Alien vs. Predator, where you have... A group of scientists caught in the crossfire of an ancient battle between aliens and predators as they attempt to escape a bygone period. Uh, this was a concept that was originated in a 1989 comic book, and Predator 2 actually was the first movie to submit the idea that aliens and predators exist in the same universe. And so the demand has been for so many years for these two crossover franchises to cross over and meet. And now here we are in 2004, and I will be honest with you, when I first saw this movie the first time around, I really didn't like it. I think a lot of people really didn't like it either because it just felt like a film that was just not delivering what it was promising. It was PG-13, you know, instead of doing it R. Like, at least Freddy vs. Jason was rated R. But this, yeah, this was a movie that disappointed a lot of people when it came out. Still made money. I mean, it was a hit when it came out. But um, 20 years later, all things considered, I actually liked this movie a lot better than I thought I was going to remember it. Now, don't get me wrong. It has a lot of flaws to it, and most of it is with the human characters. A majority of the human characters that, um, yeah, if you've seen all the other Alien movies, the, the not-good Alien movies, you know exactly what the problem with this movie is. The characters that are in here are mostly just stock characters that have no reason to be here whatsoever except to be the characters that are basically the meat for the two people you want, for the two creatures you want to see in this movie. And yes, when they're on screen, the movie is absolutely terrible. And for the majority of the movie, it is pretty terrible. But then when it's just the alien and the predator, and all the other characters are taken out, with the exception of Sanan Lathan, the movie gets really, really good. And I was actually really surprised at that, because I thought for the longest period of time, nothing of value of this movie was going to be worth it in the long run. But then, once everybody gets killed off, and it's just Sanan Lathan, just, it's Sanan Lathan just working with this predator, as, facing off the aliens... That's when the movie gets so much more interesting because the dialogue goes away, a lot of the dialogue goes away, everybody's quiet, everything happens through no, throughout much of a script, a, a, like I said, dialogue in general, and the movie just gets so much more interesting and much more engaging. Like, if the rest of the movie had been like that, if it was just one person with these creatures, this movie would have been something really, really spectacular. But no, you have to wait through a good chunk of the movie to get to the really good stuff. And the really good stuff really is good. But unfortunately, you've got a huge chunk of movie beforehand where you have to deal with these idiotic characters that you know are going to die. You know they're just not characters that are anything of value whatsoever except to be the main course for these creatures. And yeah, we got to have all the references thrown in there. We've got to have all the... It's but when the alien and predator do show up and actually, be the, and actually fight... It's a pretty badass fight. I mean, there's a lot of fun ideas when it's not the alien, when it's not the human characters, the bad human characters. The movie is really damn good. When it is, it's about as bad as you think it is. So it's definitely a very mixed bag movie, but I found that to be more enjoyable nowadays than I did back in the day. I think I think once you get all the other characters out of here, and it's just Sanan Lathan and the Predator going up against the alien. That's when the movie gets really, really good. And it's really some of the best stuff Paul W.S. Anderson has ever directed as a whole. But, uh, yeah, like I said, you got to sit through a lot of really, really 
bad stuff before that to really get to the good stuff. But um, when it does, it's definitely worth it in the end. So I do kind of recommend it. Uh, just power through the first maybe 45 minutes of the movie, and then when all the other characters are dead, and it's just Sinan Lathan and the Predator, and uh, and them going up against the alien, that's when the movie gets really, really good. And that's the part I would recommend. So, yeah. Definitely a very polarizing review. Like I, uh, like I said, first half's pretty bad. Second half, really, really damn good. I do recommend the second half more than I do the first half. But, uh, yeah. If you can power through it, it's definitely worth it when it's all said and done. So. Okay, so that's Alien vs. Predator. Now let's go ahead and move on to another sequel that came out this weekend, and that is The Prince's Diaries 2, Royal Engagement. Look out the window, and welcome to Shinovia. To Princess Mia's 21st birthday. Mia Thermopolis has everything a girl could ever want. I have my own mom. I'm glad you like it. <laughs> Except the one thing she's always dreamed of. I'm ready for a romantic fairy tale life. But destiny is going to give her a push in the right direction. If Princess Mia is not married in 30 days, she forfeits this throne of Genovia to young Lord Deborah. Shut up. I said shut up. Shut up. Get it? Because Anne Hathaway did it in the first movie, and now it's Julie Andrews doing it in the sequel. <laughs> uh, that's um, that's not really funny. Uh, you want some more mo stuff that's not really funny, but they think it's funny? Uh, here's this. Unless she can do the impossible. How could Parliament expect me to fall in love in 30 days? Why don't we find out what kind of candidates are out there? Too old. Too young. Prince William. I absolutely accept. He's not eligible. I just love to look at him. Me too. See, if Mia wasn't a princess, she could have ended up with Prince William. I mean, look what happened with Kate Middleton. And, uh, yeah. And, of course, you know, Julie Andrews has got to be thirsting for... Mary Poppins has got to be thirsting for Prince William, too. But, um... Uh, Princess Diaries 2, Royal Engagement. This is about as typical of a comedy sequel as you can get, where you have... Uh, the story that is not based on the f books by the first movie was, uh, before she can succeed her grandmother as the Queen of Genovia, Mia, once again played by Anne Hathaway, learns that she must marry or else relinquish the throne. Of course, she's got to do it in 30 days, and, um, because that's the Disney Princess formula, and, um, yeah, this is, um, this is a pretty bad movie, and, um, and I think you can tell right from the back, because it's written by Shonda Rhimes, who... Yeah, she's a prolific television producer, writer, creator. I mean, she she's the person behind Grey's Anatomy, Scandal, Bridgerton. But um, yeah, this is um, this is about as pretty lame of a comedy sequel as you can get. I mean, this is a movie that is literally rehashing the same plot as the first movie, except this time she's in it. She's now the print. Is is like it, the whole movie seems kind of pointless now. Be pointless. The whole last movie seems really pointless because. You know, they make a whole deal about the first movie being the fact that she's going to be the future queen of Genovia, and now it's just like, no, we now have this flaw in here where now you have to get married or else you're not going to get thro thrown. And if that was the worst thing about the movie, then I could let it slide, but man, their attempts at jokes in this are absolutely horrible. Nostalgia Critic, I think, did an excellent review of this that really, really shows what's all wrong with this movie, because there is a lot that's wrong with this film. Uh, the movie is not funny, it's not clever, Julie Andrews and Anne Hathaway, as much as they're trying to do, do the save as much of the charm in this movie as there was in the first film, they can't do it with a script as bad as this, and it just gets lazy comedy, like it's lazy, like I said, lazy comedy, lazy attempts to try to be anything clever or unique, and it's just, it's a mess, it's a mess of a film in general, uh, the first movie I thought was fine for what it was, for what it was, but this... This just felt like they were really pushing their luck with it, and they've been talking about doing a third one for years now. Of course, Gary Marshall is no longer with us, so I think that's one thing that's going to go against the movie. Plus, it's way too late to do another Princess Diaries sequel at this point. I know we're in this trend of legacy sequels and comedy sequels way past their prime, but there's really nothing else you can do with this storyline after all these years. I mean, but they're still trying to put it together. I guess Disney is still trying to put it together at this point, while they're also working on The Devil Wears Prada too which is another movie with Anne Hathaway in it, but, um, I don't know. I just, I just didn't find this one as interesting. It's another typical comedy sequel that's, that's not, not as good as the first movie, and this one doesn't even try to be clever or funny whatsoever, at least in my opinion it didn't, so. 
So yeah, with that said, let's go ahead and move on to our last movie that we have here, and that is Yu-Gi-Oh! The Movie. This summer, monsters never seen before will be brought to life more powerful than ever. And the battle for the fate of the future will be here. Yu-Gi-Oh! The movie. This is more than just a duel. Yugi must face the mysteries of his past. The time has come, my minions. Arise and conquer. The secrets of his alter ego. Yugi, we've only got one chance left. And his most powerful adversary. I've waited 5,000 years for revenge. Could this be the final duel? Nope. It was not the final duel. The show is still going on the air 26 years later. Over 1,100 episodes, 7 movies. So, uh, yeah. This was not the this was not the, the final duel as they were trying to pr get you to believe it was. But um, this is Yu-Gi-Oh! the movie. This is Warner Brothers trying to recreate the success of Pokemon the first movie. And now they didn't have Pokemon anymore, and even by then, Pokemon was really, uh, is that old, Pokemon was really of an old, an old deal at that point, before it eventually rose back up again, but, um, yeah, Yu-Gi-Oh! was one of those fads that came and went, kind of like with the Digimon fad, and it's, yeah, I went to go see this movie in a theater, and I think my biggest mistake going into that movie was the fact that I never saw an episode of Yu-Gi-Oh! before, and going into that th theater, Going in the movie thinking that I was going to know everything I need to know from this... No. No. If you were a Yu-Gi-Oh! fan, you'd probably find this m movie much better than it actually is. But even then, it didn't help it. it. didn't help the fact that this film was both a critical and financial failure. Even the fans of the TV series that were, uh, that were watching the show at the time looked at this and said, No. Nah, no. This isn't worth it. So in the movie, you have Yu-Gi-Oh!, who's a small and average high school student and an easy target for bullies, is given an ancient Egyptian riddle called the Millennium Puzzle by his grandfather, a local game shop manager. Yu-Gi puts the pieces together and unexpectedly becomes the powerful Game King. Now when Yu-Gi gets into sticky situations, the Game King takes over and protects Yu-Gi and his friends. And uh, this movie is really not that engaging whatsoever. Like I, like I said... Maybe if you were a fan of the Yu-Gi-Oh! series, maybe you could find some value to it, but uh, me personally, I've, I went to see this in theaters on the day it came, is on the weekend it came out, mostly because of, um, mostly because I saw it the same day as Little Black Book, which I did not like, and, um, so I went to go see this, and so I went to go see this movie and after that, and, um, yeah, I may have liked it back then, but now that I've, now it's 20 years later and I finally have seen it again, yeah, it's really not that good of a movie. In fact, it's really, really terrible. And like I said, it's a movie that's literally trying to rehash everything that made the Pokemon movies so successful at Warner Brothers. They have the soundtrack with the big with the big names on it. There, like the Black Eyed Peas is like the big name that's in the set that's in the soundtrack. But um, yeah, and the problem with it is it's really hard to distance this from Di from Yu Gi Oh and Digimon because these creatures that you see in the trailer. They literally look like creatures you would see in Digimon Digital Monsters. Like, I was really looking at this and thinking, wait, did I get, is, I'm sorry, did I get these movies confused or something? Was there another Digimon movie when it came out? But no, these creatures look exactly like they do in the, Digi, is in the Digimon universe. Like, it's hard not to see that. There's one character that literally looks like one of the characters that um, Gatomon turns into at one point. I mean, this is, it's so confusing. It's so incredibly it's so incredibly lackluster, and the movie is really, really boring. Like, it's a really, really big, dull movie that you could just tell. It's one of those examples of, you know, back when the Rugrats movie was the big success. You know how everybody was trying to cash in on the success of that and just, you know, do movies like, uh, is the, they'll bring the Wild Thornberries to the big screen, bring Hey Arnold to the big screen. This is one of those movies that, and this is more like a movie like Doug's first movie and Hey Arnold the movie where... There was literally 
nothing about this that makes this cinematic whatsoever. Nothing about this is grand and cinematic. Even the B Pokemon movies at this time were at least gr were at least cinematic and more on an epic scale compared to the TV show. This literally feels like a movie that they literally took off of television, plastered it on the big screen, and put a little glare on it to give it a look like it's, it was made entirely for anime for the big screen when it really was not. And um, yeah. Like I said, even if you were a fan of the show, most people that I know who were fans of the show at the time really didn't like this movie when it came out. And like I said, it quickly came and went. It doesn't help that the movie was released in August, which is usually a bad time to release a family film, or at least it was back then, because everybody, because all the kids are going back to school at that point. But um, yeah, needless to say, this movie has not held up well over time. It's definitely gotten a lot worse than I remembered it. It's just really not a good movie in general. It's a film that is really boring. It's really unimpressive. The creatures in this, the monsters in here look exactly like characters from another franchise altogether. There's nothing about this that really distances itself from other franchises. It feels like just another one of those imports that were trying to copy this is the same success that Pokemon became. I mean, Kids WB was notorious for doing stuff like this at the time, not just with Yu-Gi-Oh, but, you know, stuff like Card Captors, and there was also Hamtaro, and, um... And, uh, you know, Digimon, you know, uh, uh, Fox Box was one of those ones when four kids took that over. I mean, I mean, this was the, this was the thing back then, and this was just when it was just anime overload, but, and it just really, really just completely, it completely just misses the mark altogether on entertainment value, and even for, like, the big fan, is for the biggest fans of the show, even they were let down by this movie when it came out, and, excuse me, but, um, it's just not a very good film. It's just a really t lackluster film. I didn't notice it back then, but I just wanted to get my mind off a little black book because, I, like I said, I saw that the same day as this, and at the time I thought it was slightly better. Now it's kind of like comparing a peaches. It's kind of like comparing um, kind of like comparing apples and oranges. They're just kind of the same thing. I literally had to pause so I can remember what that meaning was, and I apologize for that, but um. I said, I said what I said, and I'm sticking by it. So that's Yu-Gi-Oh! the movie. And so with that said, we wrap up another edition of Time About the Movies, and when we meet next time, we'll take a look at three more movies, including uh, the prequel to The Exorcist, Exorcist the Beginning, uh, Dax Shepard, Matthew Willard, and Seth Green in the comedy Without a Paddle, and the return of Benji in Benji Off the Leash. So we'll take a look at those three movies all on the next episode. But until then, thank you so much for watching, and if you want to see more videos like this, Please hit the place on the next page, check out the previous episode, and also don't forget to hit the like and subscribe button if you want to see more videos like this on this channel. And don't go away, because coming up next, we've got essentially the finale to 1988, uh, sort of. It's the We're taking a look at Time About the Movies flashback for January 15th, 1988, which is the last weekend for new releases for the month of, for the year of 1988. But then we'll have, a we'll have a show after this for 1988 Leftovers, so there'll be one after this next one. But uh, for this one, we've got For Keeps, Return of the Living Dead 2, The Couch Trip, and Rent-A-Cop. We'll take a look at those four movies, the last four films on the official calendar for 1988 on Time About the Movies flashback, and that should be coming up right after this, so stick around.